Well, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome our internet audience. Uh, I'm Aaron Brody. I'm the director of the Bade Museum, one of the co-sponsors uh, of this lecture series that you've tuned into. I'm also professor of Bible and archeology span uh, at my home institution, Pacific School of Religion. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our, uh, to our first installment of a series of talks on topics related to women and gender in the Phoenician homeland and diaspora. Um, but before we get to our introductions, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Berkeley, California, which is where I'm physically present, is on the territory of the Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo Ohlone. We respect the land and the people who have stewarded it through many generations, and we honor their elders and ancestors. We're living in a moment that warrants deep reflection on our past and present. As a museum dedicated to advancing the knowledge of archeology span and history of the ancient Levant, the Bade Museum welcomes scholarly discussions across boundaries of nationality, religion, and gender identity. In many global contexts, equal access to healthcare, education, fair wages, and human rights is contested on the basis of sex, gender and other identity categories and gender identities. In an effort to bring light to these timely issues, to serve a broader uh, public audience online and to connect to local communities that it serves, the museum is taking action to become a more inclusive, welcoming and equitable institution that practices the philosophy of radical inclusion adopted by its parent institution, Pacific School of Religion. One of these steps is the continued creation of public programming. Through this, this lecture series, we hope to highlight new and established scholars who are engaging with risky and marginalized topics concerning women, gender performance, and sexuality in the past. We invite you to participate in these programs so that together we can listen, learn, and work towards creating a more inclusive museum community. Thank you for joining us today. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Helen Dixon from one of our co-sponsoring institutions, the Department of History at East Carolina University, who will introduce today's speakers. Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's a supreme pleasure to be here today and uh, to sort of um, facilitate this year-long discussion of women and gender in the Phoenician and Punic world, uh, a subject we all agree is understudied and um, in a way in its infancy. So uh, today with us, we have some light in the dark. Wissam Khalil is a Lebanese archaeologist and researcher with more than 20 years experience in archaeological research and in directing archaeological projects in Lebanon, the Middle East, and Europe. He specialized in archaeological excavation, survey, the study of rural settlements, and historical topography. In 2009, he earned his PhD in archaeology from the University of Paris I Pantheon Sorbonne and began lecturing at the Department of Arts and Archaeology at the Lebanese University. In 2012, he was promoted to associate professor, and in 2021, he was elected chair of the archaeology department in CIDA uh, for two years, and that position ended recently. Congratulations. <laughs> Throughout his career, he has been engaged in multiple collaborative and interdisciplinary projects that involve Lebanese and European researchers in the fields of underwater archaeology, genetic studies, geoarchaeology, chemical analysis of ceramics, geophysics, and three-dimensional scans of archaeological monuments and features. These collaborations have resulted in numerous publications in high-impact factor journals, as well as applied work in the field. Wassam is fully dedicated to teaching, research, and endorsing archaeological and historical sites, and making use of his skills and knowledge to promote arts and culture for academic, governmental, and non-governmental organizations. And we're so grateful to have him here with us. He's also brought a collaborator with him, an up-and-coming scholar, Karim Fadlala, is a research assistant at the American American University of Beirut, working on the Levant Carta project in collaboration with the Spatial Studies Lab at Rice University in Houston, Texas. And I was looking at the website for Levant Carta recently today, um, and uh, I, I recommend everybody check this out. It's a digital history project that traces the urban evolution of Beirut at diverselevant.org. Really incredible work with primary sources and mapping. Fantastic. 
He's also an archaeology student at the Lebanese University and a member of the Karayeb Adlun Archaeological Project, co-directed by Dr. Ida Ogiano and Dr. Wissam Khalil. Thank you both for being with us today. We're so excited to hear your research. Um, we'll be speaking on the cult of Ashtart, Astarte, within the coastal grottos of Adlun and Karayeb in southern Lebanon. Wissam, you're welcome to share your screen. Helen, thank you so much. Aaron, thank you so much for the presentation. I will be sharing my screen, but first I would like to apologize because a few days ago I lost my voice and now it's coming back again. So it's going to be painful for you to hear me uh, this way. Uh, so can you see my screen now? It's perfect. Yes. And your voice sounds great and strong. Okay. Thank you so much. So uh, first, I would like to thank everyone behind the uh, organization of this, uh, this series of lectures. I would also like to thank uh, my colleagues in the, uh, at the Lebanese University. I would like to thank as well uh, my peers, my colleagues, my friends of the Harayeb Adlun Archaeological Projects, more specifically Dr. Ida Ogiano. Uh, I would like to thank the Harayeb Municipality, who was, is always supporting us. Um, and a specific and thank to the Under Frost Foundation who funded um, our coastal research. This, that was very valuable for us and very important. And I would like to thank the Director General of Antiquities for their support, always supporting us in our research, the permits. Um, without the DGA, we couldn't have done this. <clears throat> so, I will be talking about the cult as the title, the cult of Astarte within the coastal grottos of Hadlun and Kharaib in southern Lebanon. And I would like to say here that uh, this presentation is the result of the work of the uh, Kharaib Hadlun archaeological project. So uh, this is a primary, uh, uh, some of the primary results resulting from our uh, investigation. So this. This mission started in 2013, and it kept on growing from excavating the sanctuary to uh, discovering a new site, excavating it, to doing the pedestrian survey, the underwater, the coastal survey, so uh, with outstanding results. So what I would be presenting here with Karim is the result of a teamwork, the result of our research in uh, in Kharaib and Adlun under the Kharaib Adlun Archaeological Project. So about the title itself, uh, uh, and to be more correct, this is more about the feminine cult within the coastal grottos of Adlun and Kharaib in southern Lebanon. As for the use of the cult of Astarte in the title, this is in reference to the interpretation of the Wasta Grotto by uh, Muter in the late 1940s as being dedicated to the cult of Astarte. So here at this stage of, of our research, we will raise more questions rather than giving answers. So I will be first talking about the geographical context, later the archaeological context, on the feminine cult, on the coast between Sidon and Tyre, and then a deep dive into the archaeology or the monuments in Adlun, later in Kharaib. And here Karim will take the floor and will present the uh, the Wasta chambers before uh, concluding. So for those who are acquainted with uh, with the Lebanese geography, this is very simple. For those who are not, um, the area of this research is located within this the highlighted in red. So we have the city of Tyre in the south, and the city of Beirut in the north, and more to its south, Sidon. So we're in between Sidon and uh, entire in southern Lebanon. On this uh, Google image, uh, uh, we uh, we point toward Adlun and Kharaib, uh, a zoom on Kharaib and Adlun, and you can see in the north, Sidon, entire as well. Also a more uh, zoomed, so here, uh, the area targeted in the research in Adlun and Kharaib. So basically, Kharaib and Adlun are two localities, uh, big localities, 
stretching uh, over kilometers between Sidon and, and Tyre. Not the only two localities between Sidon and Tyre, of course, but here we have uh, these localities overlook the Mediterranean. So we're talking about the shore, the plains, and the hills. So we have a diversity of paysage and a diversity of monuments and occupation and a long stratigraphy, a chronology, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so this uh, other satellite image from 2001 uh, shows the area targeted by the uh, pedestrian survey uh, in 2017 and 2018, and some of which continued later on. And uh, so the highlighted in red is the uh, pedestrian uh, survey. So the survey targeted areas in the interland, in Kharayib, and excavation in the interland uh, as well. So this large area, this coastal area, and this hilly area provided uh, numerous uh, features and monuments ranging from the prehistory to, uh, to the modern era. I will start with Adlun. So here we have a satellite image showing uh, the port of uh, the modern port of Adlun and the older port of Adlun, the, the ancient port of Adlun. We don't have the city of Adlun. So we have the modern city of Adlun, but we don't have the antique city of Adlun. And we don't know exactly it was until we did the survey. And we assume that it is exactly behind, I mean, it's obvious, it is exactly behind the port because this is the place where we have the concentration of reused ashlars, stones, some cisterns, and a lot of ceramics. And uh, I don't know if you can see it clearly uh, on the escarpment of, uh, <coughs> on the escarpment of Adlun, we have a succession of dots, different typology of dots. We're talking here about tombs, grottoes, and natural cavities. So these photos shows a specimen of what we can see in Adlun, mainly the big and well-known uh, uh, grotto called Magharit Um Libzez, meaning the grotto of the breast, uh, also known as uh, Abrizumofen. Uh, then we have uh, more than 60 uh, rock-cut uh, tombs, shafts, and uh, chambers mainly dating from the Roman and late Roman and early uh, Christian era. And also we have a lot of uh, quarries as well. So uh, from north to south in Adlun, the important uh, monuments, we have this particular stele from Ramses II, and we have near it the grotto, and the succession of tombs and another grotto to, to, the, to the south, the Magharat al Alaliyi, and another grotto, Magharat al Daraj. And this, why pointing to where this specific monu uh, uh, curious monument, the stele? So the stele itself will indicate, as the presence of the stele will indicate that this monument was destinated or predestinated to be seen. So we are in a context of a place that, where we have an activity and the tombs reflect the, the, uh, the typology of the tombs, the richness of the tomb. We're talking about more than 60 tombs discovered so far. We're talking about the necropolis of a rich city as well. So this is broadly, uh, we, we also have installations, coastal installation related to fishing, related to um, quarries along the coast as well. And if we go to the south, to the Litani River, we have an, an incredible discovery uh, through the work of the Kharaib Archaeological Mission which is the uh, coastal, which is, it's a tell located on the mouth of the Litani, and this tell, the chronology of the tell dates ranges from the uh, Iron Age II to uh, Iron Age uh, three and to the Hellenistic period. So here we have, we have a photo of the section of this small tell and a close up to that section where we can see uh, the remains of a wall, those ashlars with Bussage. We go to the north, we have the Tel Abu Zay, which is a maritime tell, a tell on the shore 
we, unfortunately, we couldn't explore it because it's a private property, but the ceramics around it uh, indicates that it wasn't used during the Iron Age three because we have the Persian amphoras. And here to the uh, to the uh, to the north, we have another water stream with a Roman uh, era bridge. Here we have the Bronze A site of Tel Jemjim and the sanctuary, the Iron Age and Hellenistic period sanctuary of Haraim and uh, Matrav site as well. So uh, moving toward the Matrav site, so we have a reconstruction of, of, of the sanctuary dating from the Hellenistic period. And uh, so the Matrav site, it's a sanctuary, it's a rural sanctuary located uh, on a hill overlooking the Mediterranean. It's an isolated uh, site. It, it's not part of an urban tissue. Uh, it's not a temple within a city, within a village. It's a rural uh, temple. And uh, to its north, we have another major site, which they don't, do not corroborate from the same period. The, the site to the north is Tel Jamjim. It's a tell, agricultural tell, covering all the Bronze Age periods. And the period attested the Iron Age, uh, mainly Iron Age 2, 3, and Hellenistic periods are not very well attested on the site. So we don't know exactly if the site was directly linked to a settlement or it was simply a rural, uh, a rural uh, uh, temple. So the site, the the sanctuary was discovered first by Maurice Shehab in 1946, excavated by Maurice Shehab. Later, the excavation resumed with uh, Lebanese archaeologist Ibrahim Kaukabani in 1969. Uh, ended by the Lebanese Civil War, and then the Archaeological Mission of Haraib uh, resumed the work in 2013. I have to point here that uh, the work of Ida Ojano on the figurines of the site started in 2009. Uh, here I would, uh, I'm showing the uh, Roman uh, bridge located on the uh, Abu Aswad water stream. Why pointing and showing a Roman bridge while we'll be talking about a Hellenistic use a grotto used in the Hellenistic, mainly in the Hellenistic period, because this monument indicates that this area, this coastal area, was in use and officialized by the Roman uh, Empire, knowing that this Roman road most probably took place or officialized a an earlier uh, pathway. And this earlier pathway, I mean, we can assume that it exists and most probably existed because we have a succession of sites and monuments and the grottos themselves and indicating that this area was in use as a communication uh, passage. <clears throat> so in two words also about the feminine cult in this, in this uh, specific area between the southern uh, coast of, of Lebanon, Sidon and Tyre. So we know through text from the second half of the second millennium from Ugarit or from Egypt, once mentioning uh, Atirat, uh, second time from Egypt mentioning Astarte. So we know that the cult existed during the second uh, millennium, but it is until the uh, 8th century uh, BC that the uh, we have inscription attesting the uh, worship of uh, of Astarte it becomes more frequent and moving through time during the 5th century it becomes more and more frequent and here we have the inscription especially inside it and we have the inscription of King Tabnid that he qualified himself as the priest of Astarte and we have of course the inscriptions and the monuments in the temple of Ashmun and we have the previously we have the Ashmun Azar uh, sarcophagus inscription mentioning Astarte as well. So, uh, and here talking about the specific area, whether this area was under the domination of Sidon or was under the domination of Tyre. In fact, it depends, but assuming that we are north of the Litani, we most probably are under the sphere of the political sphere of Sidon. Uh, and at some period, it is Tyre. I'm not going to go into this debate here. Uh, but just to point about the use, uh, the, the the cult of uh, the feminine deity Astarte in here. And also we have uh, the cult of uh, of Tinit, and we have an inscription from Sarepta dating to the 7th century, 
uh, mentioning uh, a dedication uh, to Tanit and uh, Ashtar linking both divinities and why mentioning this because we don't know exactly the nature of the cult uh, in, in the grotto, whether we're talking here exactly uh, about a cult dedicated to Tanit or to Astarte, <clears throat> but that would be revealed hopefully in, uh, in the future. So uh, in Adlun, uh, about this, uh, this tale, so as I mentioned, this tale indicates that this, uh, this monument was predestined to be seen and to impress. So to be seen and to impress, and here it was, the tale itself is located on a narrow strip, located on the escarpment overlooking the city of Adlun and probably where people would pass. So the monument itself was destined to be seen. Pointing here, we have uh, an important passage, international passage, international international pathway between North and, and, and South. Unfortunately, this stele was destroyed and it took us a while to find its place during the survey. And this is what is left of it, unfortunately, uh, today. The necropolis of Adlun, as I mentioned, also indicates that we are in a rich context. The city of Adlun was a rich city, at least during the, uh, the Roman and during the uh, Byzantine period. And, but just to know that through the, the survey, we have ceramics related to the uh, Iron Age as well. So here we go to, and we talk about the important stuff related to the cult. We're talking about the grotto. So we have this important grotto, Magharit uh, Lipsez, an impressive big grotto. Unfortunately, today it's closed. Uh, so this grotto was first uh, explored by geologists and uh, the grotto uh, revealed during the excavation of the early 20th century and the study of the material that took place later on. Lower Paleolithic associated to the Asherian and Yebrudian cultures. And we have the Middle Paleolithic as well associated to the Mosterian and to the Valois culture. So the grotto itself was in use. And uh, unfortunately, the uh, excavation of <clears throat> this historic excavation destroyed the historical levels. So we'll know if while excavating, they found ceramics or objects or altars related to some kind of cult. And here, like in the future, we have to go to the archive of uh, of, of Zumafen, uh, who excavated, hoping to see some uh, something leading to the cult. But why saying that? It's not because of the day that we are assuming that the grotto was, was used uh, for a feminine cult, because we have, and I will show later on, we have the graffitis of the uh, triangular uh, pubic uh, female uh, uh, pubic. And here it cannot be seen except as related to a feminine cult. And while surveying, we found additional ones because the ones located on the exterior facade of the grottoes were seen and uh, attested by Mutter. But like we, we tried through some light and we found uh, additional ones, hence, it was used for for the feminine cult, and also we have an opening on top of the uh, on top of the grotto that opens in here, and collecting some stories from local people. So when it rains, women would go and bath in the grotto with that water, seeking fertility or well being or health. We don't know exactly, and we don't know. I mean, since the memory of that cult, since the memory of that practice is still alive in Adlun, I mean, we assume that maybe um, maybe until the 20th century, we don't know if the excavation during the uh, early 20th century, I mean, stopped that practice. I mean, this is to be investigated furthermore. And uh, speaking about the uh, the Magharit Ibn Bzez, so we have another one. I mean, in fact, we're not talking about just like one. There is several grottos in Lebanon labeled with the breast with the bzez, and one of which is a grotto located in in, in, in Beirut, in the center of Beirut, in the, in, in the neighborhood of Ashrafi, on one of the hills. 
and as you can see in these photos, and unfortunately, I couldn't find my photos. I found these from an article published in 2019. So as you can see, that maybe this was probably an hypogeum with, you know, with good localities, and then later on was used as, of course, as what I'm saying here, maybe it wasn't a natural grotto. It was a tomb, and later on, the function changed, and it become a um, an important Christian shrine dedicated specifically to Magharit Sayyidat Libzad al meaning the grotto of uh, Our Lady uh, of the Breast, the miraculous Lady of the Breast. So this is another example. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and moving south in Adlun, we have another grotto with an interesting name called the Grotto of Alali, the High Grotto. And here we have uh, traces of work facades. The grotto itself is still very rough from the inside. We have work facades, ceramics around, and we have niches, several niches that we cannot see here in the photos. But we have also cavities uh, cut into the rock to, to fix uh, wooden beams uh, for some use. And seeing the place, how tiny it is and how not comfortable, we cannot assume that it was used as a storage or anything else. So we assume that it's related to the uh, to some cult and probably a feminine cult. Moving south way as well, we have another grotto called the Grotto of the, of the Stairs, Magharta Daraj. And here we have, uh, we have the stairs that goes from the grotto and continues toward the, uh, the Mediterranean and it's now covered by the uh, coastal plain. And seeing the grotto with a, a human scale, the, as well, the grotto cannot be used for anything. It cannot be used as a storage. It cannot be used as a shelter. It cannot be used for anything. And why bother a stair leading to a grotto and carving these stairs like a long one, 100 meters toward, uh, toward what reason? So we assume also the importance of this tiny cavity cannot be seen as storage or shelter. It can be seen as a continuity of a cult in, uh, in this uh, Adlun escarpment. So we move south toward Kharayim, and here we're talking about the sacred Rokka chambers in Al Wasta. So Al Wasta is an area or a neighborhood in within Kharayim. So these chambers were first <clears throat> were first mentioned by travelers such as Jules de Bertou. In 1843, so he describes uh, shortly uh, the grottos. Then Ernest Renault would provide a very important documentation of uh, of the chambers later on the valley, and we have the uh, the important article uh, written by the Jesuit uh, Mutard and Bolio, La Grotte d'Astarté à Wasta. Uh, uh, and later on, of course, we have the publications. It was. Uh, mainly by Corinne Bonnet uh, publishing about the uh, the inscriptions. So uh, the site itself is known, uh, but it uh, it was lost. How how is that possible? So uh, all those until Montaigne they managed to see and look locate the the site. And it see according to Mater during the Second World War that that the, the, the chambers were damaged. Why? Because we had uh, fights on the Litani and the Zaharani between the uh, the forces of Vichy and the forces of the Allies. And uh, so he mentions that the uh, <laughs> so he managed to take photos and document the grottos in nineteen uh, before nineteen thirty nine. It was damaged, and then nobody mentions. Nobody visits uh, the chambers. And it took us a while to figure out where they were. It took us three years to find uh, the place of, uh, of the, those chambers. Why? Because after 1948 and the Nakba, so a Palestinian camp, I don't know when exactly, was built. So the Palestinian refugee camp was built on top of the rock and around it. And the grottos were, were used since as uh, storage, but they were lost. And then even while going toward uh, the uh, 
the Palestinian camp, we it took us a little bit to identify where. So it was like covered with, with, with soil and litter and and, and spoil. And the chamber to open wasn't the chamber that is the most interesting one with all the uh, pubic triangles and with all the uh, uh, Greek and Phoenician inscriptions. So the chambers we opened, unfortunately, wasn't uh, much uh, uh, because also the travelers and, and even whatever, they, they talk about the Hellenistic Ipogeum. And we went to some of those, uh, one of the Ipogeums that we managed to see. And in fact, it's a Roman Ipogeum, not Hellenistic period. And they mentioned something about uh, Ipogeum with a, with a circular, uh, with an arched entrance that we couldn't see, assuming that also we have around those chambers a succession of, of tombs that would be interesting uh, to uh, to uncover. So the chamber we, we, we opened, uh, we we have we tried to explore it, and we have seen it was covered with, with, with sediments and soil and garbage. But we noticed that uh, we have, uh, we don't have inscriptions, but we have on all, but if, trust me on this, if you go inside, you see an infinity of crosses all over the, the facades, uh, attesting, of course, uh, some Christian cult uh, uh, that uh, that is past the use of uh, of the other chamber, the nearby chamber. By the way, the second chamber was is like a few meters to the south of this one. So here I would leave the floor uh, to uh, to Karim, who would be describing uh, the uh, the the chamber uh, of Alwasta, the in, the most important chamber in, in Alwasta, before later on taking the uh, the floor and concluding. Karim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sam. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening. Uh, in this part of the lecture, uh, we're going to give a brief description about the Wasta Grotto, uh, some of its inscriptions, symbolism, and briefly discuss the nature of the cult. Uh, the significant location of the Wasta Grotto, of the main coastal road stretching between Sidon and Tyre, uh, its proximity to the coast uh, and to the villages of Kharaib and Adlun, combined with the votive inscriptions and cultic symbolism it offers, um, makes this coastal sanctuary a noteworthy point to understand the religious rites practiced in the hinterland uh, uh, between Sidon and Tyre uh, during the Hellenistic period. Uh, so as mentioned previously, uh, we can uh, clearly distinguish two chambers in this curious rock formation. Uh, the northern chamber containing carved crosses, as mentioned by Wissam, and the second chamber known as Magharit al-Firij, uh, or the Grotto of Astarte. Um, this rectangular chamber is accessed by a three-step uh, staircase. It's nine meters wide, six meters deep, three meters in height, with a rock cut bench that borders its eastern wall. Um, uh, the chamber has suffered some unfortunate disturbances, as uh, Bolyar Moter uh, noted a deep excavation. Uh, along the bench, uh, thus prohibiting the access to the Eastern Wall. Uh, additionally, also concrete was added to the floor during the Second World War, um, thus uh, raising the ground. Uh, the Eastern uh, Wall, as we can see, contains three niches. Um, the central one probably accommodated a divine image uh, or a cult statue uh, protected by a metal grill. Uh, as evidenced by the two round holes dug at the bottom uh, of the niche uh, with bronze or iron rods uh, remains that supported the metal grill. Uh, below, an uh, offering table between two columns um, awaits donations or offerings from visitors. Um, in the left niche, uh, from the inside, stands out a sort of an art stele uh, under which uh, the principal Greek inscription that we're going to discussed shortly, is engraved uh, in a rectangular frame. Uh, the southern wall uh, is as well narrowed by the rock cut bench uh, and features two uh, niches, one rectangular and one semicircular, 
Uh, as we can see, both uh, walls carry inscriptions, graffiti, and of course, uh, uh, the pubic triangle symbols. Um, with regards to the northern wall, it separates the two chambers of the grotto. Uh, this wall was maybe built by Christians to hide the pagan symbols uh, present in the second chamber. The most uh, comprehensive inscription in the Wasta Grotto, uh, which provides us with uh, significant information, is the one located on the eastern wall uh, under the left niche. Uh, the votive inscription, which is made up of uh, four lines, the longest being 32 centimeters, inside a triangle, uh, a rectangular frame, is incised in Greek characters and uh, language. The inscription is dedicated to Aphrodite and a king whose name is partly erased. Uh, Renan mentions that the central part was scraped away, proving hard to read, uh, but he was able to identify that a king uh, is addressed based on the title Basileia. Um, and after reading the visible letter P, thus proposing that Ptolemy is the mentioned king. Um, we can note that many have reviewed this text. We can mention uh, uh, Bolio and Muter, uh, recognition of Ptolemy IV, uh, Philopater, uh, reasoning that the dedication represents as a last gesture of loyalty from a Phoenician to the uh, Ptolemaic king. Uh, he also hinted that Arsinoe III, uh, the wife of Ptolemy IV, could be Aphrodite represented in the dedication. Uh, with regards to the Ptolemaic queen's uh, self-association uh, representation of being connected to the divine world and associations with goddesses, uh, as in the case of Arsinoe and uh, Aphrodite. We can, uh, we can as well mention Friedrich Zucker's uh, study, which points uh, towards Ptolemy I, uh, Soter, uh, as the mentioned king in the dedication, uh, which places uh, the dating of the inscription to the beginning of the 3rd century BC. Um, now, given that the inscription dates to the Ptolemaic era in Phoenicia, it's uh, plausible to assume that it was uh, carved uh, in the 3rd century BC, uh, uh, and the use of the cave during the Hellenistic period can be verified. Uh, Zucker highlights the intriguing nature uh, of this work, uh, which comes from a Phoenician writer, Pemilkas or Emilkas, um, yet was intended for Greek readers, uh, an undeniable uh, observation in which uh, Corinne Bonnet explored further. Um, uh, Pemilkas uh, or Emilkas, the devoter, is a Phoenician name transcribed to Greek, carrying the theophoric element Malik. Uh, additionally, Zucker uh, suggests analogies for the epithet. Uh, uh, epikos demonstrating the adjectives eastern connotations. Uh, for the second inscription, um, uh, this graffiti was found on the southern wall inside a frame uh, along with a triangle. Uh, the inscription was reproduced by Renault, but unfortunately was, met was missing after the war. Uh, but stampings were taken for it. Uh, what makes this inscription particularly interesting is the fact that it's in the Phoenician language, but written using Greek characters and alphabets. Uh, Hoffman proposed a partial reading of this inscription, mainly for the first four lines, uh, stating that the text is transcribed from Phoenician. Uh, he read Abed Tenni, son of Abed Safon, uh, supposing two theophoric names uh, for the dedicator and his father, uh, separated by the Greek word vios, uh, which means son. Uh, then we read the, the term neseot, which uh, also is transcribed from Phoenician saad, meaning uh, offered or I offered. Um, this interpretation of the inscription was as well uh, addressed by uh, Morris uh, Schneiser um, as he recognizes that this dedication is inscribed by Abed Tanit, son of Abed Safon, who presents an offering to the divinity Pan, uh, which in a theological context presents us uh, with an unknown divinity and makes the Wasta Grotto as the only mention of a deity uh, named Pan. Uh, as for Bolio uh, and Muter, uh, 
palm is interpreted as an occurrence uh, or occasion, um, that is to say, as a sign of a completed visit. Uh, this inscription is incised, uh, inside a triangle and offers a hybrid aspect, um, and it's of two proper nouns. Uh, the top in Greek reads uh, Irene, which means peace, uh, while the bottom in Phoenician reads uh, Baal Akas or Baal Akka. Uh, the last character is doubtful, uh, a theophoric name that bears the name of Baal. Uh, also on the eastern wall uh, and under the central niche, which probably contained the cult image, uh, we find a graffiti uh, drawn in a rectangular frame and accompanied uh, by the triangle inside the frame. Um, Renan rightly noted that it's hard to read and distinguish the original characters from the features that we may, may be added later to disfigure the inscription. Uh, after proposing the reading uh, Lirabat, uh, Renan quickly rejected it, uh, questioning if the inscription is semantic in the first place, and also questions uh, if the characters are Egyptian hieroglyphs uh, traced with a very bad tool. Um, we know that Astarte is frequently uh, referred to by the epithet uh, Lirabat, which means lady, uh, but this reading remains extremely speculative. Uh, also, it's worth to note that other inscriptions in the Wasta Grotto appear to hold uh, Egyptian uh, and probably even Sephitic names. Uh, we can mention the name uh, Pisaios, a late form of uh, Passos, uh, inscribed above uh, a triangle symbol. Uh, the linguistic origin of the name is Egyptian. Uh, also, another example of an incised name uh, in a triangle here next uh, to the palm tree and the door, uh, the line of characters is uh, very lightly engraved, which according to Renan could be uh, Nabataean, as Mutet judges uh, to be closer to Sephitic. Um, the grotto uh, represents uh, also a world of symbolism relating to a feminine fertility cult uh, de dedicated to a goddess worship. Um, but before addressing the images that accompany the text uh, and the pubic triangle, we should quickly uh, reference Renan, who considers the Wasta grotto as a prostitution cave uh, and the remainder of a primitive state where men, uh, like animals, sought caves for mating. Um, also adding that the triangle sign at the entrance of the caves served to justify the destination. Uh, of course, this interpretation uh, is primitive in its nature. Uh, the recurring pubic iconography represented by the triangle, which is carved all over the walls of the Wasta Grotto, in addition to other symbols that accompany it, uh, like the palm trees, the palm fronds, um, and the dove, uh, is an attested symbolic language relating uh, and referring to different fertility cults, uh, as documented in the Bronze Age and Iron Age uh, Near East, in which they frequently employ these iconographic features. Um, the extensive use of the pubic triangle is to reiterate fertility beyond uh, its sexual nature. Uh, and this is made possible by the presence of palm trees, palm fronds, uh, and votive inscriptions near the triangles and sometimes uh, even inside it, uh, which serve as an affirmation of the goddesses' fertili fertility related qualities. Um, Hence, the link between uh, the triangle and the different symbols present in the grotto are, are not erotic connotations and should be interpreted uh, as being linked to fertility uh, rather uh, than prostitution. Uh, when discussing the nature of the cult uh, in this cave sanctuary, um, it's essential to note that caves dedicated to a goddess worship or a feminine cult uh, is not only limited to the Levant. Cave sanctuaries have been identified um, all over the Mediterranean, 
although these sacred places in the Levant uh, maybe have received less attention when compared with caves in the Punic Mediterranean, um, caves are liminal spaces uh, and often linked uh, to the divine world. They are perceived as a threshold between the, the familiar and the unknown, between the mortal world and the divine world. Um, regarding uh, the Wasta Grotto and in light of, uh, of the evidence presented to us, we can support the hypothesis, the hypothesis of a feminine cult based on the Greek inscription mentioning Aphrodite, uh, which in the Phoenician context is associated with Astarte. Um, uh, there is ample evidence of the two deities' ancient integration. Thus, um, it makes perfect sense that this would be the case in Wasta um, within a cave adorned with symbols related to fertility. Uh, however, in the dedication, what part does uh, Ptolemy play in relation to Astarte? Um, now, as evidenced throughout Phoenicia, uh, the practice of uniting the king with the, with the goddess or Astarte is well attested in the epigraphic record. Uh, and it's through this human divine connection uh, that uh, the goddess bestows her uh, protection, the blessings upon the king, uh, even his powers and abilities. Thus, the connection between uh, Aphrodite and Ptolemy in the dedication um, would be a sort of continuation of Phoenician heritage, but with Hellenistic uh, features. Um, Another element about the Wasta cave inscription merits uh, mention. Uh, along with the Greek uh, dedication, travelers placed inscriptions with Phoenician, uh, 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 Greek, Egyptian, and probably Sapphitic names, which means that this sanctuary was visited even by people outside of Phoenicia. Uh, we know that geographic uh, landscapes, uh, in addition to maritime and inland uh, routes, have often played a significant role in the position of sanctuaries uh, or temples. Um, and the location of the Wasta Grotto along the main road between Sidon and Tyre, uh, which is an area of passage, in addition to its proximity to the coast, uh, to the Litani River, and the possible port site uh, in Tal Kasmiye at the mouth of the Litani River, which was identified by the Kharaib archaeological project dating to the Persian and Hellenistic period, combined with the nature of the fertility cult practice symbolized by the pubic triangle uh, that offered unifying ideas and shared beliefs, uh, thus attracting diverse people and giving the grotto um, its international character. Back to you, Isan. Thank you, Karim. So uh, we still have a few minutes. So the link between Adun Grotto and the Wasta Grotto. Uh, so first, I would like you to, if you can see clearly, this uh, right picture where we can see a pubic triangle carved. This is on the this exterior facade. And we also have on the interior, we cannot see them very clearly, but we have a section of others. And this would remind us also what we've seen in the uh, Wasta uh, chamber as well. <clears throat> and here, it's a close-up uh, photo of this triangle, uh, pubic triangle in uh, in Adlun, Magharat and Ribzez. And we have this sign that we don't know if, but there's a similarity with, uh, or like, it might be um, um, a graffiti or a carving of a, of a boat. Uh, it's not exactly the same as the one we can see on uh, on the big bachelors of uh, in uh, in kitchen in uh, in Cyprus, but we have this, and then we have another symbol, a circle with a with a line, and we have parallel lines. So, just want to say that investigating this this grotto would give us would provide us more uh, proofs on a feminine cult within this one and maybe other inscriptions as well hopefully so this is to link this uh, this grotto to what we've seen in uh, what we've seen in, in Wasta. so although the grotto of adlun uh, 
uh, as reported, does not offer any inscriptions, there is there are evident parallel or similarity that are coming between these two sacred spaces. So first of all, if we're gonna consider that each grotto is a sanctuary, both sanctuaries, or if we're gonna add as well the Alali and the Daraj, these sanctuaries are situated along the same coastal road between side and entire and are both accessible from the road. Even if we don't know exactly where the road used to pass during the Iron Age two or Iron Age one, two Persian period, uh, Hellenistic period, but we know we can easily trace it uh, during the Roman period and the uh, Ottoman period, but it's not going to differ whether it's going to be on the coast or whether it's going to be on the first steps of the escarpment, meaning that these grottos are easily accessible to uh, travelers uh, and uh, people passing by. <clears throat> Both caves contain carved triangle on their walls as the Wasta Grotto offers more information with the presence of inscription. The same symbolism interpretation can be interchanged between Wasta and Adlun. That offers less information and data, making it possible to hypothesize that the Adlun Grotto is also linked to a feminine cult. If we assume that the Wasta Grotto was dedicated to Astarte, also we can consider that uh, the Adlun Grotto can be also linked to Astarte as well. To add and related also to this uh, to the symbol, if this symbol is uh, is accurate, and not just that, knowing that the grottos are located uh, all over the Mediterranean and close by to the Adlun port and to the uh, Kasmi uh, port as well, the possible seafaring aspect of Adlun Grotto, as attested by the boat sign next to the pubic triangle incised at the entrance which may as well give the grotto an international character with people visiting the sanctuary from overseas and outside of Phoenicia. <clears throat> so uh, I think it's more judicious to talk about a feminine cult within the coastal grottos uh, of the area stretching from uh, Adnoun to Kharaib, from Sidon to, uh, to, uh, to the Litani. Even if you might assume that and were more or less quick in their interpretation of the nature of the cult, attributing it to Astarte. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, maybe it's Tanit, maybe both. Maybe there's a third party here, and not to any other form of the deity. So I think this assumption is plausible. Uh, so as I mentioned, because Astarte gave importance in the territories of Sidon since the Iron Age too, also, the signs found in the Wasta Grotto are linked to the cult of Astarte. So, here I'd like to conclude, um, and this is a classic, furthering the investigation within uh, the coastal uh, strip between Adlun and Kharaib, and specifically exploring those grotto and chambers, uh, is a must. We need to uh, record all the uh, graffitis. We need to record all the triangles. We need to look for inscriptions. We need to use some technology. We need to 3D these, these monuments in order to push the research. Uh, and also we need to trench. We need to, to collect all the ceramics and we need, to, we need to do some test trenches to set the chronology. So what well, here I'm, I'm calling for a future investigation in this area and um, I will end up my presentation here so if you have any questions please thank you so much this is incredible thank you for bringing this important series of sites to our attention and uh, thank you for persevering in what has been challenging research from the very beginning three years to relocate these so-called known uh, sites grotto sites so we have um, eight questions in our uh, chat here. I want to encourage anyone watching live on YouTube to type your questions into the live stream chat and those will get sent to us to uh, address the speakers. Um, but we'll start with a couple of sort of technical questions to clarify some of this evidence for those it's new to. Um, first, could you compare the Adlun stele of Ramses II to similar ones known from Nahr al-Kalb? 
Why do you think Adlun was selected as a site of public inscription by this foreign empire? So yes, we can compare because we, we're here in the same context. And if we take the geography of both Nahr al-Kalab and uh, Adlun, and if we add to those other type of study, the one near the Bekaa in Kabul Yas and the other ones in the Wadi Brisa as well, all those were put in a place near strategic passages. So Nahr al-Kalab was a strategic passage. Adlun is a strategic passage as well. And also, personally, I don't, don't want to go into territories or marking territories but it's a proof of power and this monument was predestinated to be seen so it, this should be put into the, the global context of iron age marking power territories and impressing as well and sending messages <clears throat> thank you uh, second technical question for clarifying on the Grotto of the Stairs, Mugarid al Daraj. Is it clear that the stairs have been fully preserved up to the entrance, or is it possible that the original depth of the grotto or the cave has been, you know, damaged, cut, collapsed? Are we sure that's how it was sort of originally when the stairs were carved? So the stairs, they stop at the grotto. But wow. inside the grotto, we haven't seen yet traces of carving. Mm. Maybe, I I mean, as you see in the photos, there is some sediment that needs to be uh, that needs to be cleared before revealing the the intersection and uh, and maybe other uh, carvings or cavities. I don't know if Karim, you have something to add here, as you've been part of the uh, the survey of the uh, of the Daraj Grotto. Uh, regarding the stairs, as you said, they stop at the entrance of the grotto, but uh, this needs uh, further in the investigation as the sediment needs to be cleaned and uh, needs to uh, we need to document it more. But uh, definitely the stairs stop at the entrance of the grotto. Wow. Thank you. Okay, so now... We're most, mostly very interested in these the cultic activity that you've described at these grottos. So the next few questions will, maybe the rest of our time we'll spend on that. Uh, the third question I have for you here is, can you say more about the reuse of ancient grottos and tombs like the Grotto of the Breast uh, for ritual practice? And is it exclusively for feminine cults or fertility? Or can you talk about some of the other cave grottos that have been reused over time? So, uh, if we're talking about specifically here, the two grottos, the one, the two labeled as the breast grottos, the one in Beirut and the one in Adlun, both are related to feminine cult and even modern ones. So, even for example, the one in, uh, in Beirut is frequently visited by women seeking milk, uh, health, a pregnancy, and the story, I mean, the only story connected, which is like very impressive. But taking those two examples, for example, Beirut, I'm sure that the Beirut grotto was a tomb and then it became a sacred grotto. So we don't know if that cult uh, survived uh, for millennia or maybe because every population up to the 19th, early 20th century kept some types of cult of the grottos as we have the cults of the tree, of the sacred tree, giving the example of the sacred tree, the fig tree, podium of, uh, of, uh, of Afa temple from the Roman period. Population there is, the population there is like, most probably since the 13th, 14th century, uh, basically uh, communities, Shia communities. But within that podium, we have the statue of the, uh, of, of, of the, of the lady, of the virgin lady, with, uh, and the fig tree with all, you know, like the, uh, the tissues and, you know, like personal objects, feminine. So we have in the Mediterranean, as we have that in Cyprus, we have it in Lebanon, we have it um, maybe in Sicily as well. So we have the sacred tree, and we have the sacred grotto. So we cannot say that 
these grotto continuously kept on maybe every new population or like every new generation, maybe sometimes there was some gap, maybe a continuation, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh some some in some periods uh they reinvent the cult because you know bringing the cult from its newer version so i'm not going to talk about continuity because we can see this traveling uh, but there is always this archetype of the grotto and the sacred related Excellent. to the feminine cult yeah Thank you. This speaks to a question we got from a YouTube audience member, Tai Ain Taylor, who asked, uh, I wonder when these cults disappeared and why? You're sort of speaking to that perennial uh, reactivation of the ideas in these cults. But could you uh, speak a little more to the second part of this question? Are there any possible factors in the disappearance of these cults? And could you recommend further reading on the topic of the fertility cult in, in the Lebanese context? Um, the disappearance of the cult, I would say clearly and loudly, since the 50s onward, it was catastrophic. So we lost a lot of um, the traditions, not talking about only about specifically uh, the cult and the grottos or on the tree. But I remember that back in the 90s, visiting some of those monuments, I've seen more objects related to offerings between brackets than what I'm seeing today. So modernism is killing those, you know, like also religion is killing those as well because mm-hmm. people are are more informed or more either more informed about the specificities of their religion or more distant to religion or other practices. So unfortunately the last 20 years were devastating in this regard. So I'm afraid that these traditions will will vanish yeah. uh, about reading uh, on this topic of the coastal if somebody can recommend something for me to read as well because <laughs> well I was thinking of um, it's not exactly what I, I'm sure this person wants to read about like Phoenician Hellenistic Roman fertility cult but I'm thinking of also the work of Noor Farah Haddad at the Lebanese University oh, yeah, yeah yes, maybe yes, her yes, stuff yes. you want to say something about yeah, I don't know if it goes very deep into like yeah. the first millennium, but yeah, it is. Yeah, she she writes uh, almost ethnographic work on these interreligious cave shrines, how people learn from each other across religious lines, what to do in order to uh, enact rituals for their personal problems, only some of which are <laughs> fertility related, I suppose, but maybe that's what you mean by it's not exactly perfect yeah. for the recommendation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wrote a paper on the uh, the sacred tree and the temple of the cult of Adonis and Astarte in the Valley of Nara Brain, but unfortunately not yet published. Uh-huh. So, uh huh. <laughs> so, the Roman period, but. Okay, we all go and follow with some on academia.edu. We will learn more shortly. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Our next uh, question from YouTube. Um, Is there a maritime cultural significance to the grottos? Can you say more about that connection? Yeah, Aaron's seconding the motion. Uh, Can you say more about that really intriguing connection between uh, the potential ship graffiti, the simplified form that you notice there, and other maritime significance? Yeah. So I hope, because we're a little bit skeptic about this symbol. It can be uh, both. It's the only one. It looks like a boat, but not spe- exactly like a boat. And sometimes, you know, like it might be a modern thing. I don't know. So in general, as Karim highlighted, in the Punic sphere, we have uh, proofs of that link between the grottos and the marine activity, talking about Sicily, uh, Grotta Regina, talking about other different uh, grottos, I, I can't find the name of specific grotto in Tunisia. So um, we have some, we're more documented on the Western Mediterranean than on the East, on the Eastern Mediterranean. I cannot say more. Huh? Um, I mean, we, I know, we need we to wish we could more. say more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think. Uh... Also, also talking about uh, showing those uh, carved boats from Kitchen mm-hmm. on the temple. The body of the temple of uh, innovative of context. Can, it's perfect. Yeah, exactly. And the, this is a link between 
Astarte and uh, the Mariners, but specifically in Adlun, Kharayib, not yet well attested. And I see Aaron but, wants uh, to jump in on this question, please. And just to follow up question that's related, which is, uh, are any of these grottos visible from the sea? So if you're on a ship, can you see the the openings clearly from the sea? Bingo, yes. The big grotto, the umlubzels can be seen easily. The other two might not be seen, but God knows what type of activity happened there, or even the uh, the Wasta chamber, whether like there was some fire. We don't know. But yeah. like you know, if if you're a good mariner, you can easily spot because we're talking about escarpment and the uh how come that everybody all those travelers managed to see uh, the the wasta chambers because mm. that was invited to me by Karim the description of this whitish layer of of limestone the big white stone so everybody we go to the big white we're walking around walking along the coastal road we see the uh whitish we go there and this is where people would find. We couldn't find it because it was no longer that whitish because of all the buildings it was. So yes, they can be seen if the mariners, but like at least the big one is easily distinguished yeah. from far. <clears throat> Great question. Thanks for that. That's helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, next we want to talk a little about the crosses in the first chamber of the Wasta Grottos. Have you done any comparative iconography yet? Do you know why the forked ends at the end of the cross bars? Any parallels? What do you make of that? Well, uh, I think maybe the closest parallel can be parallel, not in terms of the shape, because I haven't uh, been uh, to the documentation there. It's from Tyre, we have some graffitis on one of the chapels on the spina of the hypodrome, but we need more exa to examine. So the question here, whether like through the typology of crosses, we can we can say something. If specifically these crosses can say that we are crosses typical from the early Christian era, are we talking about the 11th, 12th century, 14th century stuff? I don't know. And that was something on our agenda in the research. Uh, I mean, the research there halted a little bit because of, of the COVID as a start. And now we will resume this. So I, I have no answer here. If somebody among the crowd is more familiar with this, uh, with this type of cross that look a little bit modern, by the way, mm. not so archaic, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time to skip to a question about dating the pubic triangle symbols. I'm sure it's a nightmare. Uh, how how long do you have a sense that the grottos were in use for? Can you be confident about at least a minimum date range? How are, how are you dating all of these inscriptions and use periods? So I will, uh, I will answer and then... Uh, 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 Karim would, would follow. So first, according to the uh, the Greek and Phoenician, it goes under the, we are, we're in the context of the Hellenistic period here. So I don't think we have something that can be uh, earlier. <clears throat> and also uh, speaking about the context of the feminine cult, I haven't mentioned that the sanctuary in Kharayi excavated by Shehab, Kaukabani, and the, uh, by Ida Ujiano as well. Uh, Kaukabani and Kharai, they, it's, they think that this is most probably a temple dedicated to Astarte. And through the study of the figurine, Ida Ujiano demonstrated that the feminine cult was practiced there. So we don't know exactly, it's a feminine, there's a feminine presence, there's a feminine cult. But that is attested uh, mainly in the Hellenistic period. So we still have a dating problem. So through the Hellenistic period, yes, earlier in the grottos, we don't know. And unfortunately, uh, a fine cleaning of, uh, of the surroundings and revealing the archaeological remains 
and but with this lack of the ceramics can can give a, a clear idea about the, the use and the disuse of these places those crosses i'm pretty sure is related in a way or another to or they could be uh, a reaction to what we can see in the other one Karim, do you have something to add <clears throat> yeah exactly as uh the chamber, uh, we still didn't access it. We located the chamber, so we haven't seen the triangles up close. But what uh, what we gathered from the information presented to us, especially that there's no attestation as to ceramic finds or dating in any way possible, and it's nearly impossible to date the carved uh, features in the rock, yet... Uh, uh, the, the the interesting observation would be to see if the inscriptions and the triangles would superimpose, but uh, maybe uh, trying to date uh, the triangles. But of course, uh, a cleaning of the area uh, would maybe reveal an earlier use since in terms of the pubic triangle, this is well attested in the Bronze Age and Iron Age. Uh, the naked goddess and the incised pubic triangle. But of course, this is uh, still, uh, uh, this needs study. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, uh, if I had funding, I would give it to you. Please keep working on this. I hope I hope that you have uh, the the time, the access, the funding, and the um, will to keep working on this really difficult material that is so fascinating as evidenced by all of these questions. I'm sorry for those we didn't get to. Um, thank you so much for coming and attending. I'll turn it over to uh, Aaron Brody again to uh, close us out. Great. Well, uh, I'd also like to echo uh, my thanks and the museum's thanks to um, both of our scholars today. What a, a wonderful presentation. And Helen, thank you for framing it so nicely. Uh, and I'd just like to let our audience know, of course, that this series does continue and we're looking forward to uh, our January presentation uh, by Dr. Uh, Becky Martin of Boston University. So the specifics are she'll be speaking on January 25th, also a Thursday. Um, also, at uh, nine, nine, it'll be live at 9.30 a.m. Uh, West Coast time, so California time. Um, and her uh, paper will be uh, entitled Gender Representation on Anthropoid Coffins. Uh, if you're interested in um, some more specifics about the lecture series that goes all the way into May, um, please just uh, Google it and find the Bade Museum's website. You can get future information there. But I'd just like to conclude by thanking uh, both of our scholars from today uh, and also our audience for um, coming uh, to this event uh, and learning. So thank you very much and look forward to seeing you all uh, in January. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, everybody.